Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to of our interview with the exorcist with Dr. Douglas Gabriel. Douglas is going to show us uh, some interesting backstory as to how he followed his star. Douglas? Yes, John. Well, I'm so glad to be back having these conversations with you. Um, even though they are extremely painful to go back into the ancient history of my life and look up some of these things. And what I notice when I do because of the temporal displacement in my brain and the fact that uh, a clairvoyant really doesn't believe in time, uh, we will have to do some jumping back and forward in time. And I'm not going to hesitate from doing that in, the, in our further talks. And I'm not going to review what we had already talked about because really this is somewhat of a biography and you like to tell a biography in a timeline, but this won't necessarily be in a timeline. So we had reached the point where basically I'd come to your town to Detroit and started studying anthroposophy. But I have to jump back because there's some things that I think that I missed that are very important. But you have to bring in a few little uh, tidbits from before, like where you said that Detroit was the last place that you thought you wanted to end up. And so that that contextualizes uh, what what we're going to be addressing here, right? Exactly, because literally it was the last place on the earth that I wanted to come. <laughs> and the whole the people would say, "Why did you go to?" At that time, it was the murder capital of America. Detroit was, and they said, "Why did you ever want to come to the darkest city in America?" And I'd say, "Well, it was the only place that I could study anthroposophy and get a degree." So I want to jump back. I want to jump back to Father Meredith, uh, excuse me, Ma Major Meredith Thomas, Thomas, who was the chaplain in the island, which I can name now, the top secret island, Shimia in Alaska. And I want to go over how it is that I came to theosophy. Because really, you can't understand anthroposophy if you don't have a frame of reference that includes theosophy. So I just would like to highlight that and then We'll be jumping forward a little bit and jumping backward a little bit to talk about a few other things that I think are kind of critical to this whole picture. Plus, I don't just want to give a biography. I want to give the biography of someone who has been clairvoyant all their life and uh, not so much now because of my uh, illnesses and drugs and treatments I've taken. But the point is, is that in those days, I didn't know about Rudolf Steiner. So basically, when I was on that island, when I was 20 years old, and I was with uh, in the military working for the National Security Agency, spying on Russia, as they called it, or electronic warfare, it was the technical name. I was a systems analyst spying on Russia with a variety of different forms. But he was there, and he was the chaplain. And I asked him, of course, straight up, because he became my deep, deep teacher. And I told him about my condition, my birth condition, birth effect. And he said, well, you know, then I'm going to get you some spiritual books. So he ordered, he had the capacity as a major to order anything that he wanted for our library there. So he ordered a copy of Manly P. Hall's Secret Teachings of All Ages. Great place to get started. As you know, if you read that book, it takes a long time and a, what do you call it? A... Um, you have a to magnifying look. glass. It well, takes a it depends, magnifying glass to read it. <laughs> well, it depends on what version. You know, I've had the the big one. The, the one you had was the smaller black one. And so the print is very, very small. But it, it's a giant uh, tome, really, with uh, fancy cover and uh, beautiful with those those illustrations in there are just uh, excellent. They're just perfect for it. Yes. And though I had studied with um, the priest, um, Father William Bresnahan, I had not studied occultism per se or esoteric Christianity or the, you know, the mythologies of uh, the Egyptians and so on and so forth. So I started reading this book and he ordered, I loved it so much that he ordered a lot of Manly P. Hall's books. Manly P. Hall was in California and he had the Philosophical Research Society and he's an absolutely brilliant man. And he would write and then when it would get to the most delicate part, like talking about the Akashic Records or the Akashic Chronicles or these things that are really way out there, 
he would just quote Rudolf Steiner and then end right there. He wouldn't even give a Steiner reference. He would just quote him, put it in quotes. So I came back to Meredith Thomas and said, what is this? Who's Rudolf Steiner? And he goes, I don't know who Rudolf Steiner is. And we, you know, we looked it up, but you couldn't find anything in those days. We didn't have an internet. So I continued to read this. And while I was up there for that year, I was in a, a job where I really didn't have to do a lot, except when the big red lights started flashing, then I'd have to go to the machines and it cost $10,000 a second to run these machines. And so I would, you know, be spying on the satellites going over us and so on and so forth. So I read these and I started reading a lot of Manly P. Hall. And of course, Manly P. Hall references Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, H.P. Blavatsky and Theosophy. So I said, can you get me some of these books? So he got me her principal works, Secret Doctrine, Isis Unveiled, and many of her other books. So I was reading them. Now, Father, uh, I always call, keep calling him Father Meredith Thomas. He's a major. He was a priest, though, so he was a father. He was uh, an ordained minister. And so I would say, well, this is what I'm reading in these. And he'd go, great. I said, well, what do you think about it? He goes, I don't know. I haven't read them. <laughs> I said, oh, okay. Well, what do you, should I be reading these? And he said, yes, absolutely. This is definitely part of your path. And so I would read these books. And many years later, not that many years later, five years, four years later, I sent him a bunch of Rudolf Steiner books that I'd found when I'd finally come across some of Steiner's books and sent them to him with a note saying, what do you think of this? And he read them. He sent me a note back and said, as far as I can tell, everything he says is true, but this is not my path. I'm too old. And he was, he was probably in his, he was quite old. Even when I met him, they had activated him from the Air National Guard kind of as a punishment and then sent him to the worst place uh, in any military branch. And that was this island, Shimeum. And so he said, it's not a path for me, but one thing I am certain of, Douglas, it is your path. You need to study this. It's like the conversation between Owen Barfield and C.S. Lewis. And Lewis, he, he gave, Lewis, he was doing translations, Rudolf Steiner, Owen Barfield was, and he'd give them to other members of the Inklings, the circle that met at the, what, the, uh, the Eagle and Child in Oxford, you know, and with J.R.R. Tolkien and Lewis and all these wonderful people, Charles Williams. But uh, he would give them translations of Rudolf Steiner's lectures he was doing. And Lewis told him, he says, I see what it is, but it's too late. I'm too old, you know. And he was already, uh, he was a celebrity on doing those uh, radio talk shows. And so there's a certain sincerity that you find with some of these authors and like like interesting things like when they don't know they'll tell you they don't know <laughs> exactly and so i realized this was my path so i'm reading the secret doctrine and if you've ever read the secret doctrine it's a very very difficult thing to read in my life i've read it three times and i don't know many other people who've spent that much time reading it because it's so complicated and i read isis unveiled three times I read it three times because I didn't understand it the first couple times. And, and then in the third, I thought I understood it a little bit because by then I'd come across Rudolf Steiner who explained many of these things. But the point is that we were up on that island for one year and we didn't uh, get to have any breaks. We didn't go on any kind of leave. And he, Meredith Thomas, left. And uh, I think it was a week or two later, one of my youngest brothers passed away in a motorcycle wreck. And so they sent me home. And about a week later, the only airstrip on that tiny little island split down the middle. And no one was able to come and land on the island uh, for months. They had to send out these basically like attack helicopters to deliver supplies and things. And there was only one pilot who would land on the island anyway because the crosswinds were so terrible. So I went home. And my brother had passed away, but I knew he had passed away because I could see it through my mother's eyes and I could see her heartbreak. So when I got home, I'm thinking, okay, where's my brother? I can see people after they die. So how come I don't see him? Well, he was in a motorcycle wreck. And sometimes when you're in a motorcycle wreck, you don't know 
you, that you're dead. You don't wake up for a while. So oh, after maybe a few weeks, he woke up and he was in my dreams every single night for seven years. And that's because that's one third of your lifetime. You relive it. And so I would experience him every single night in my dreams. But in every case, he was someone else. And only at the end of the dream would he take off a mask and reveal who he was. And then I'd say, oh, this was an episode of what we did when, we, when he was alive. And he was going backwards in time, reliving these things. And I was accompanying him. And that really did teach me how to be able to accompany anyone um, that I was associated with after death because they are going to be reliving some of those things. Well, I was given two week, uh, two month leave. And so I said, well, I have to go to Wheaton, Illinois, the headquarters of the Theosophical Society, because I need to get more Theosophical books. So, so I went there and it's a beautiful place, big old mansion. It was the um, American headquarters for the Theosophical Society. But just as interesting was a bookstore that was right next door to it. I don't really know whether the Theosophists created the Quest bookstore, but they had all these books in it. And oh my gosh, I thought I had reached heaven. Every type of bizarre spiritual insight or the missing life, the missing years of Jesus Christ's life or you name it. Now, I didn't like most of the Theosophists. And, and in this Theosophical headquarters, they had every Theosophical book there was. And the librarians there were Frank and Annie Hall, who you knew quite well, right? I didn't know at that time that they were going to become Waldorf teachers and become two of my best friends. But they were very nice to me because I'm there and I'm saying, you know, I really like to gather these books up, but I can't you know, uh, I, I want to read all these books here that I have over in this pile. And they're saying, well, you know, you can't take them with you. And this isn't a lending library, but we will show you one little trick. And they took me in this room where they had doubles of these books, which they were literally getting rid of. And they said, look, you can buy these books for like 10 cents, 50 cents, whatever. So I collected up a bunch of them and took them back to my home and I was in the Quest bookstore and I bought a bunch of books there. And then from that time on, I kept buying books from the Quest bookstore at a very rapid pace. But while I was there, I met a very strange character. One of the strangest people, I won't go into describing this person, but he had a collection that he had found in a uh, attic of some old theosophist. And literally there were like 500 books. And he says, I don't even like this stuff. He was there working on the building or something. He said, I don't even like this stuff. You can have all these books. So he gave me, I swear it had to be at least 500 uh, theosophical books. And so I had this massive library of uh, theosophical books and I just started reading them like crazy. And wherever I was assigned, I went back to Fort Devens. Every spare moment that I had, I was reading theosophical books. And it was very, I couldn't find any psychics there, right? Not a single clairvoyant did I ever meet. Now, we, you and I, when we were lecturers at the Theosophical Society in Detroit, we met, uh, what's her name? Dora Coons. And she had some capacities. She was, she could kind of even tap into the Akashic records a little bit and be able to tell you a little bit more about history than the history books tell you. But besides her, I found nobody there even though the Quest bookstore was there and everything psychic you could ever imagine, every channeled book that was out at that time was there, but I still couldn't find anybody like myself that I could, you know, commiserate with and say, you know, uh, how do I develop this? How do I um, take this further? What do I do with this capacity? And so theosophy became really the foundation before I read any Steiner books. Now, mind you, they didn't have a single Steiner book there. And in the Quest bookstore at that time, they had, you know, like three Steiner books. So I got those. But um, basically, they're kind of anti-anthroposophy, anti-Rudolf Steiner. They're, but Rudolf Steiner was a theosophist, and he started his German section of, well, he was the head of the German section, I believe, and then later broke away to create anthroposophy. So these people didn't help me at all in terms of that. And if you've read Blavatsky, you will basically run up against more 
um, comparative religion ideas than any place else that you can possibly look, but it's not going to help a person like myself try to develop my capacities. Yeah, well, that's uh, an interesting, uh, if you don't uh, get to the seven mysteries that you keep making reference to, you don't have anything to frame these types of conversations because uh, an individual is fourfold. So your oldest part of your being is your physical, starting in the in the uh, primal warmth of old Saturn. And then you have your etheric that is the life body that corresponds to the realm of the plants. And then you have your astral body, which is your animation and your uh, sympathy and antipathy. And then halfway through Earth evolution, an ego was donated to mankind, that, that possibility to be an independent being. And so that's the central quest we're discussing here. Just so people are wondering, what is all this? That's what it is. Yes, exactly. As you pointed out, that's helpful. That shows you how in your own self you find these cosmological ideas, because in Blavatsky, there's cosmogenesis and anthropogenesis. It's strong on cosmogenesis. It's strong on comparative religions of the East. But when it comes down to what does the human experience directly in their soul, or how do you contact your spirit? Mm, not much. And then her followers, W.C. Leadbeater and Annie Besant, who took over the Theosophical Society when Blavatsky died, I hated their books. I thought they were garbage. And I couldn't understand how in the world did, did they go from a Blavatsky to an Annie Besant? It was like, uh, so I, I started to get pretty, mm, what do you call it, um, dissatisfied with studying theosophy. But I did continue. And later I went out to Ojai, California, where they had the Cortona Institute, which is like a retreat center. And I hung out there and, you know, talked to people. Again, no clairvoyance, nobody who could say that they were on a path or could show a path to basically get to where I already was when I was born. And so I was trying to work backwards from being a clairvoyant to looking at these books and saying, well, okay, I can arrive at some of this stuff, but how, what does it mean? How could I ever explain this to anybody? So really theosophy was a big disappointment until Robert Thibodeau and his family, I, I convinced them to go up into the Sequoia forest with me. Cause as I've mentioned before, I love to go to the Sequoia forest. So we went up to their place called, um, Oh, High Meadows or something like that. Anyway, it's up in the Sequoia Forest near Redwood Mountain Home. And it's, a, uh, <clears throat> it's like a summer camp. So we're standing there because Robert Thibodeau and his wife were both theosophists. And in theosophy, you have the esoteric section, which I became a member of later, and co-masonry, which is a type of masonry that allows women in. And so Colleen was very much a part of all of that. And then their two boys were with us. And so we go to this camp and we're standing there at a place because they were having some food and we were going to buy some food. And I'm saying, you know, is there anybody around here who's clairvoyant? I mean, you know, this is the most magnificent place for clairvoyance in the whole world in the Sequoia Forest. Isn't there somebody here who actually has the insight that like Pavatsky would have that might be able to contact the Akashic records and speak to the masters as Blavatsky said she did. And the person laughed and said, oh, well, there's, there's this one person and that, and his name, she said, Peter. And I'm like, oh, Peter. And what's he do? He just, and they just kept laughing and they'd say, well, he, he just appears and then he'll take people on tours in the forest. And a uh, matter of fact, we have he said he was here a few days ago. He said he's coming back and going to take people on a tour of the Crystal Cave here. And I said, really? This is fantastic. How do I get in contact? They just kept laughing. No one knows how to contact him. Wait, he doesn't have a phone? You don't know where he lives? No, no, no. He just shows up and, and, they, and they're laughing. And I couldn't understand why they were laughing. And then all of a sudden I'm looking at them and I read their thoughts. And their thoughts are, turn around, bozo. And so I turn around and here's this ancient guy. He must be in his 70s or 80s. 
but he looked as healthy as he could be. He was one of the most beautiful, radiant beings I've ever met. And he, blue eyes, when I looked in his eyes, I thought I was looking into the blue of the sky. It, it was, it, it humbled me 100%. I was ready to almost drop down onto my knee and say something to him. And they said, you see, and that, now we were at the tent. There was no, nothing behind us. And he just appeared. And I could see that he appeared at a certain moment because they started really laughing at me. He's standing behind you. So I turned around and uh, I started to talk to this man. And you know how it is when you're with a master being, all your questions dissipate. You, you can't think of a single question. And I wanted to ask this guy a jillion questions, but I, I no questions came to my mind. And finally I said, oh, can we sign up for the tour? to go that I just heard you're going to do a tour in the crystal caves. I've never been to the caves and you know, and then I'm going on chattering. Uh, I've been here many times and I know the forest backwards and forward, and, then, and I've been down to the one cave, but they say that you're going to another cave. And when I was all done chattering, he just looks at me with the greatest love and says, there are many things you have yet to learn, Douglas. I didn't tell him my name. He says, there are many things you've yet to learn, Douglas. And I'm like, yeah, that, that's true. Okay. <laughs> Especially because obviously you know a lot that you're not too anxious to tell anybody else. And so he says, well, I was going to take them on the tour, but I think um, I won't be doing that for a few days. And then I turned to Robert and Colleen because they were still, they hadn't even turned around to talk to him. They're still ordering food for themselves and their children. So I turned around to say, um, well, we're going to be here for a few days, Robert. Do you think that we could set this up, that we could go with Peter on this tour? I turn around, he's gone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, a year before, this is so strange, one year before, because mind you, I would go there and try to spend the entire summer, you know, it was, you know three months or as long as I could, up in these forests, by myself, hiking out into the forest, uh, because to me, it's perfectly magical. And the year before, I had been kind of near this place, and I was walking along, and all of a sudden, I look down, and I see gold, radiant footprints. I probably told you this story. Yeah. Gold, radiant footprints. And I'm going, whoa, what is this? What kind of being leaves big, pretty big footprints? He was a big guy. And, uh, and so I'm following this, and then they appeared, and then they just disappeared on the trail. They were there, then they were gone. And so I knelt down and started praying, asking, what is this? What is this? And they said, you've seen the footprints of the master. And I said, well, what's his name? What's his name? And after a very long time, the, the, a voice said, his name is Peter. So I believe that I actually met a master being, which is what I was intending to do with the theosophy is meet one of these masters that uh, Blavatsky talks about. And I tell you, I've, I've been back there many times. He hasn't shown up again. He just disappeared. I don't know how it is that he had been around for years and years, and then all of a sudden was going to take people on a tour and then didn't show up again and didn't go back again. So I don't know what that's about, but that was, you know, somehow connected to theosophy. Well, when you get close to this kind of material, if you can develop your focus, to where you, you're capable of creating a sacred space, that is something that is uh, conducive towards that type of experience. If you're coming at it uh, really out of uh, anxiety of distraction and all kinds of abstract thinking, it doesn't help. And it's being able to, as you do, work so much with taking your ideas into the realm of imagination that shows uh, that you're, you're there. And so you can end up with that kind of a scenario. And that's, it's funny, Rudolf Steiner does talk about it. I mean, there's the famous incident of Jakob Bema, the, the shoemaker, back in the days of Rudolf II. But he... Uh, heard somebody at the door and he goes to the door and, and there's this guy out there telling him that there's going to be a, important things for him to do, you know. And so they just kind of dip in and out. It, it's not necessary that you 
uh, have them so that they're they're visibly present, but it's it's they're they're giving you a, a point of connection, and you can work with it as a, a conscious space. You know, like when David Spangler, we'd bring him to town, and I'd think up all these questions I was going to ask him when he got here, and never failed. By the time he got there, I'd how are you doing, David? You know, I'd, the questions were resolved. Absolutely, and with Yaka Burma. I think the uh, story goes uh, that this person standing outside of his uh, shoemaker shop said, Yaka Burma, come forth. And he's like, oh. oh. So he comes out and sees this person. The person says, you're going to do these amazing things. And this is a person who they said didn't know Greek or Latin, barely wrote, uh, barely was able to read. But shortly thereafter, standing right about in the same place, he turns around and looks in through a window at a pewter dish and the sun shining off the pewter dish went into his eye and he received enlightenment and began to speak Greek and Latin and everything else. And then he wrote some of the greatest books on uh, spirituality and Sophia that anyone ever wrote. So I'm beginning to think that that being, I don't even know if he was real, but somehow he had something to do with opening me up by just saying, Douglas, <laughs> there's so much that you don't know. So, you know, you need to humble yourself and you need to, you know, be prepared to learn more. Well, of course, I wanted to go meet Manly P. Hall also. So at some point, I can't even remember when this happened, though I know it was some weeks before he died. So at this, I would have already been in Detroit. I don't remember why I uh, all of a sudden just had the impulse in the summer to go visit Manly P. Hall. So I went to the Philosophical Research Society in, I think it's in LA, isn't it? And uh, basically I had called ahead and made an appointment with him. And so we sat down and I had brought him um, these little things. Remember the Tinkerbells they used to sell at the Mayflower? They, the most beautiful little sound like angels. They call them angel tinker, tinker, tinkerbells. And I had a couple of these and I gave them to him. And I was ready to ask him a thousand questions, but I did get one question out and that was, what do you think of Rudolf Steiner? And he goes, well, I've really never studied Rudolf Steiner. I said, but wait, when you come to a, a difficult uh, question that you're trying to answer in the secret teachings of all ages, you quote Rudolf Steiner. And he goes, yes, I know that. I know that. But I've never really thoroughly studied Rudolf Steiner. And I could not comprehend how this genius who knew Blavatsky backwards and forwards, he knew everything backwards and forwards. And by the way, I had listened to him because I was there for a while and I uh, attended a couple lectures of his and straight, I used to listen to his tapes, his cassette tapes, giving talks. Well, he gave a talk that I had listened to on a cassette. And mind you, I had a very good memory in those days. He gave the exact same talk word for word with the same inflections, the same everything, the same references, everything. And I was like, whoa, that's incredible. Then I heard him do it again. And then when I sat down and had, uh, I had a number of talks with him and I'd say, how is it that you do that? He goes, memory isn't mine. It belongs to Christ. That's how I'm able to do that. I'm like, okay, there's my lesson uh, that I'm supposed to learn from this man. But he let me into the library. He even showed me the safe where he had these books and I wanted to see his oldest copy of Most Holy Trinity Sophia written by the Comte de Saint Germain. And he showed these things to me with such graciousness. It was just incredible. But he was like a child. And I could look at him and I, I knew he was going to die soon. And he did. He died like very shortly thereafter. Uh, and he didn't really have any wisdom that he needed to convey to me. Why? Probably because he had already written it all down. He'd given, you know, hundreds of lectures which I'd listened to many of these tapes, read most of his books, though you can't say you've read all of his books because there's so many of them. But basically what I got from that was uh, also a very peculiar circumstance. I said, okay, um, Mr. Hall, why is it that you're wearing a suit that's like five times too big for you? You know, And he goes, well, I had elephantitis. My entire body swelled up with elephantitis except for my head. And so I'm sorry, I apologize that I still wear these suits. These suits hung on him. You could have put three of him in one of those suits, right? And I'm like, you had what? <laughs> what are you telling me? Your body 
does that ever happen to anybody? I mean, he said, well, it happens to people's legs or an arm or something. But for some reason, my entire body swole. The, the doctors couldn't explain it. They just called it elephantitis. And now I've shrank back down. And he'd just laugh. He was like talking to a, the most beautiful child. And I swear, he had one foot already into the spiritual world. And uh, it was kind of hard to quite communicate to him, but he still could give a lecture word for word perfectly as he had done 20, 30 years before that. He was the greatest philosopher. But I asked him, are you clairvoyant? Do you have any uh, contact? Can you contact the Akashic Records? Is that where you get some of your information? He goes, oh, no, 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 nothing like that. I have had to work very, very, very hard for everything that I put in my books or that I say. Yeah, he uh, he was wonderful. If you want to get behind Manly Hall, then you really, yeah, the secret doctrine, Isis unveiled, and then uh, the translations of the Greeks by Thomas Taylor, so that he'd read a lot of Plotinus and Proclus mm -hmm. and uh, Iamblichus and Porphyry and that whole Neoplatonic school. And that's how he approached his, his uh, curriculum, so to speak. And plus his, his uh, studies in Advaita Vedanta, in, in Indian studies, and his studies in Buddhism. So he was a, a very well-rounded guy. But yeah, he stayed in his yard. You know, he had a, he, he's like uh, many of those types of people. You'll, you'll meet him and you'll have a similar experience, you know, that they have 50-some lectures that they do. And they can do them over and over. Well, like Werner Gloss, for example. He was like that. He had what fifty some lectures, and, and even I remember that one time when he was in the middle of the lecture. It's where he asks if somebody has a watch, and Douglas is sitting there. He's holding up the watch before he even asked for it. <laughs> and the first thing he did was take his watch off when he started the lecture and put it right there so he could see it. So it was just a device to engage the audience. And yes, Werner's lecture. He had fifty four memorized lectures. I heard some of them 11 times over. So I literally almost memorized these. And at one point he said to me as he was doing the Rudolf Steiner biography uh, series, uh, he got an emergency call right during it. And he goes, oh, it's okay. I have to leave. Douglas is gonna finish this. And so I stood up and finished it because I knew it so well. But the Manly P. Hall, I said, do you have a photographic memory? He goes, no, 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 no. I said, well, how in the world do you remember this? He says, you don't have to memorize anything that you're not going to use again. And if it isn't true, and if it isn't related to your spiritual path, you don't need it. And that's when I finally said to myself, oh, I should stop memorizing stuff if it's really real. And then he used the words uh, from the Bible. Um, in that moment, do uh, God will, well, I'll, I'll have to paraphrase it, God will give you the words that you need. He will fill your mouth with the words that you need. And so from that moment on, I said, oh, I'm going to relax a bit. I'm not going to try to memorize Blavatsky's secret doctrine. I'm not going to try to memorize a lot of these things. I'm just going to hold on to the things that were my path, which is the path of towards Christ. So he gave me that, it was like a transmission. And even though they may not have been clairvoyant, some of my greatest teachers gave me a transmission and the transmission was to basically not really instruct me, but basically say, you don't need that. You don't need that. Just stay on this path here and you're fine. Yeah. It's uh, developing a, a kind of a symbiotic relationship with, with your books, you know, uh, from very early age, I was told to imagine a library in my mind and, and if I wanted to look up something, walk over and find the book, you know. And so it's it's there's different mnemonic devices that you can use to be able to access the information you need. But I finally, like you, summed it down to uh, truth serves its own ends. All else serves as compost, nurturing its growth. Is that yeah? All this other stuff will fall away when, once you get a clear path that you're on. You're you're working toward the light. It's all there. And uh, he did say one thing to me. Uh, I said, you know, I want to be like you. I'm saying to Manly P. Hall, 
I want to be able to do these things that you do. I want to really be a, a, philo a spiritual philosopher. And he said, oh, well, here's the trick. The trick is go up to this part of your head, go right out in front, see yourself, you see your hand writing on a pad and write down what it is that you wish to uh, memorize or keep, keep in your mind forever. So he says, you know, make a mental note, but literally do it objectively so that you see your hand writing. And I'm going, oh, and so I've been doing that ever since then. And it does absolutely work. So, you know, and he also died of mysterious conditions and the stories were crazy, but he had, well, now they estimate it, you know, about $2 million worth of the rarest books that you can get in Western esoteric tradition. And he was married a second time and his wife uh, basically wrote a whole description of how he died. And there were three people came into their life when he was older and he'd been sick and they took over his business and taking care of his finances. And basically she says that those three men murdered him and then stole the books. Well, as you know, the Mayflower was called by some people when after Manly P. Hall died. That's how we knew that he had died. And uh, they'd called Robert and the Mayflower and said, do you want to buy some of these books? And we can give, make you a great deal on selling you these books. Later, it was found out that that the, those that one of the people who called was one of those three people who his wife believed murdered him. And then there was the whole story of red fire ants had eaten parts of his body by the time that they had the autopsy done. And so she believes that he was uh, murdered left in the car or on the ground. And the fire ants aren't even supposed to be anywhere near there. So they don't know whether they brought in the fire ants to, uh, to basically hide the evidence, but they'd done a bunch of things that uh, looked for sure as if he had been murdered. So I believe what she says, I believe he was murdered. And those books, she ended up selling some of them for a really great deal of money to two sets of those books. And the others went to these three men who then ran the Philosophical Research Society into the ground, and it basically was extinguished at that point. Yeah, it was a sad uh, sequence of events. Yeah, Maria Bauer Hall is his uh, his, his uh, wife at the, at that time. She uh, she's noted for writing on uh, code Elizabethan uh, uh, number letter codes. In, in like mostly British documents and all that. And going back to the Steganafric works of uh, uh, Johannes uh, Trithemius, who was the teacher of Paracelsus and uh, Cornelius Agrippa. So there's this whole uh, underlying tradition that's coming at Manley Hall from all these different esoteric streams. And I, I have a letter upstairs that he wrote to me Really nice letter because I sent him a copy of the Nuggets from King Solomon's Mind when we published. And uh, he looked like Errol Flynn on this huge body, you know, the, the, for most of the time. But like you said, he that eventually the weight went away. Uh, but he had been dealing with elephantiasis. Uh, it's it's a strange story, but he was a really active in, in Freemasonic circles on the West Coast. And also he was involved with Max Heindel over at the Rosicrucian Fellowship. And so he was very much into them. So he had familiarity with their material. Now, I, I remember years ago going with Brian Lynch and meeting the head of the esoteric section of the Rosicrucian Fellowship. And he says, well, yeah, when they get to the higher levels, then we study Steiner, you know. <laughs> That's right. As Rudolf Steiner said about Max Heindale, who lived in California, anything can grow in California. And quote I got is, initiated. Is the quote, quote is, uh, oh, he went to California where, as you know, anything will grow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I joined Amoric and I joined Max Heindale's group and I joined the Theosophic Oceanside group because I found out that Theosophy was broken into two or three different groups. And then, of course, Steiner broke away from Theosophy because... W.C. Leadbeater and Annie Besant claimed that this boy they met on the beach in um, Adjar in India, uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti, was the new Christ incarnated. Now, you can imagine 
I, of course, had to go meet him, right? Uh, C.W. C. C. Yeah. Not W.C. That's why you're here. You're thinking her W.C. Fields. <laughs> That's why you're here, John, to make sure to correct my <laughs> things that are misplaced in my brain. Because I I don't didn't like Leadbeater, and I didn't like his church. He created a church where he did a, a different form of the seven sacraments, as Rudolf Steiner had renewed the seven sacraments for his Christian community. Uh, well, Steiner wasn't a part of the Christian community, but he uh, gave a renewal of the seven sacraments to a group called the Christian community. So the lead beater version of the Holy Eucharist and the sacraments, I joined all that. I actually was part of uh, Nidra Brooks was our theosophical leader in Detroit and her husband, what was his name? Doc, uh Dr. Richard, Richard Brooks. Brooks. Yeah. So I'd go to their house and I'd go to the, you know, the Sunday services. And personally, I didn't like it at all. So I no, stopped didn't, going. Didn't resonate with me either. I, I knew Richard, though. He'd come and I'd do, I'd do a lecture at TS and then he'd stop by the store after and just start conferring with me about things that I've said. But And here's this guy and he can read Sanskrit and uh, also Chinese. He was a professor. Uh, of Chinese at, at Oakland University, a fascinating guy, you know, it's, he was very much into Advaita Vedanta, but I didn't resonate with the uh, Annie Besson school. And Nidra Brooks studied the secret doctrine, whether, and she actually had met Annie Besson, you know, so she was like ancient. Remember? Oh, she was, she was like a um, field marshal. She hated <laughs> anthroposophy. And she would tell uh, Robert and myself and anybody who would listen crazy stories about Rudolf Steiner, the way he'd planted black crystals throughout all of Europe so that World War I could create and the way that he had manipulated I, von, I von Moltke into the war and all that. Mm. And that it took me years to, to research that and figure out that all those were the theosophical lies to keep people from Steiner. But as you know, we tried to merge anthroposophy and theosophy in the Detroit Theosophical Lodge. And, you know, it didn't really ever work out so well. But anyway, I wanted to always meet Krishnamurti, right? So I had studied Krishnamurti's books, found them to be kind of flat, not really much there. Certainly didn't believe he was the uh, new Christ. Christ only incarnated once. He was not Christ. He later... Um, uh, basically said he, he he left the Theosophical Society and uh, said none of that was true. Everything that they said about me, it's not true. I'm just a normal, humble, not, well, he didn't say humble, but a normal person, simple person. And so one day Werner says to me, uh, Douglas, Krishnamurti's on the phone. I want you to talk to him. I'm like, what? Krishnamurti's on the phone? Okay, great. I wanted to talk to this guy forever. Because I didn't even know how to find Krishnamurti. I didn't realize when I was in Ohio, in Ojai, California, that he was right across the street in his place called um, Oak something or another, Oak Meadow or something. Uh, no, Oak, uh, whatever. Anyway, he had his little center there. And so I go, you know, this was constantly happening to me with Werner. He'd go, Douglas, so and so's on the phone, talk to them, help them out. And I'd go, okay, great. Jump on the phone. I'm talking to Krishnamurti. And I'm asking questions. I'm saying, oh, you know, uh, uh, I've read your books and this and that and this and that. And so I, I got to ask him some questions. And he says, okay, now let's get to the point. The point is I have some people here who are teaching in my school because he had a community there and they're teaching Waldorf, but it's kind of pseudo Waldorf. It's not really Waldorf. I need someone to come and set up a real Waldorf program for my children because they deserve that. The children that were part of his commune. And I said, Oh, I'd be happy to do that. And so, um, uh, I was flown out there and uh, I get in LA and I'm driving to Ojai and I'm going through this mountain pass and a windstorm starts that is so bad that I couldn't drive. Nobody could drive. Everybody was pulling over. It was like a fantastic windstorm, no rain, just wind that was blowing your car right off the freeway. So I'm in a rental car. I pull off, I get in a sheltered area and I say, well, yeah, I had to uh, call to tell um, Krishnamurti that I wouldn't be able to make it there that night uh, or, you know, like five o'clock or six o'clock, whatever it was. And so I had to weather this storm and uh, I pulled over, jumped in the back seat and, and and slept. And I didn't 
none of the windows were down, couldn't have the windows down. The wind was blowing so darn hard. So in the morning when I woke up, all the windows were down and I had had, an, I had a dream that I had met Krishnamurti and that he had gone to heaven. And I'm like, what? <laughs> to heaven, this guy must really, really be spiritual, right? This is amazing, you know? Uh, so I get up in the morning, I drive there to Ojai and I go there and everybody, every person I see there has got a sad look on their face. And I go into the office and say, I'm here for an appointment with uh, Krishnamurti. My name is Douglas Gabriel. And they said, well, we're so very sorry. He died last night. And so I guess he, he, I believe somebody rolled my windows down and it wasn't me. So I don't know how that happened. And the wind was uh, uh, not blowing in the morning. And I felt as if I had, had taken a trip to heaven. So what happened was the people who were the two teachers, this man and woman, uh, they were married, who had been the teachers, they were quitting. And so they were going to go start their own thing using just the materials they had. And so they did. And it's called Oak Meadow. It's one of the best and uh, homeschooling programs you can get. And it's very close to Waldorf, though it's not Waldorf. And so they moved out. And so my job was supposed to be to assess the situation, tell Werner, you know, send teachers because, you know, Werner was, you know, creating teachers and the teacher training program um, to the tune of about 35 a year. And they were in big demand, but Werner was had committed to Krishnamurti that, you know, we would help. And so I went out there, I assessed the situation, came back, told Werner, and eventually we sent some uh, people there and they started a true Waldorf school there um, in his place, which I can't remember the name of. But anyway, it was a very strange thing. I had read these books on education before I went to meet him and I was all geared up and, you know, it was like, finally I get to meet this guy. And then what happens? He dies right before I get there. Yeah, I only have one story from uh, the night that he died, and that was that's that they he had a copy of the of Rudolf Steiner's The Philosophy of Freedom on his nightstand the night that he died. He had left a book for me, which is so strange. Why would he leave a book unless he knew he was going to die? And you can't get this book. It's called The Search. It's a poem. And it's a beautiful poem. I would say that I've oftentimes described it as the 10,000 things. Because in Taoism, it's you search and search until you find the 10,000 things. And then you realize that there's only one thing. Well, in this book, it goes through, I have done this. I have done that. I've done this. It's a poem. It's a long poem. And so he left this book. Very rare book. I was searching uh, the other day, preparing for this, can't find a copy anywhere. And so he left this for me as a gift. And I had had to believe that he knew he was going to die. But when I talked to him the day before, he was sprightly. He was gingerly. He was, he was just delightful. He was not like a child again, but just full of hope and full of buoyancy and ebullient and all this kind of thing. And so I was totally bummed out that I didn't get to meet him. But these things happened because I ran the bookstore. And if you remember in the previous talks, the first time I came through Detroit and I met Werner, he said, well, how much time you got? I said, well, I'm going to, I got a month before I got to do something. He goes, set me up a bookstore. I said, oh, okay. So I set him up a bookstore. And when I returned, I worked in the bookstore. But I also donated because once I realized I was going to go to the Waldorf Institute in Detroit, I went back home, gathered up all these theosophical books, brought them there and donated them to the library. So literally hundreds and hundreds of books. I can't even tell you how many. But then one of the two directors threw out a bunch of the theosophic books because he didn't want them in his library. But then Warner said, no, 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 you have to. I'm not going to mention the guy's name. You know who I'm talking about. <laughs> he says, no, 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 you have to leave the secret doctrine and Isis and Veil and Blavatsky's work. You can throw out Bassant, you can throw out Leadbeater, you can throw out Peruker, you can throw out all those, but do not throw out Blavatsky's books. And boy, he was mad. He, he thought it was like putting Satan into a, 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 a Holy Eucharist or something. And so he I don't think he ever forgave me for that. But anyway, I'm in the bookstore, and this is also the same bookstore, this little bookstore, because Werner didn't know the English titles. 
And he didn't know the publishers. And he didn't, because I was desperate to get everything in English. And I'd been in, I knew what wasn't in English. And I, I knew the difference between this and that. And so I ran the bookstore. But every once in a while, he'd just say, Douglas, talk to this person and help him. <laughs> I go, okay. And one time it was Kathleen Kennedy. Another time it was Marsha Lucas. Another time it was Krishnamurti. And then the next time, another time, it was uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, who was considered to be one of the greatest Tibetan uh, teachers who had come to America. He was in Colorado, and he called up Werner and said, I want to start a Waldorf school. I have a school here called the Seed School, uh, but we want to have Waldorf. So again, he sent me out. I got to meet Trungpa, uh, Trungpa as they called him, Trungpa Rinpoche. Uh, but this guy was not unlike others like Raj Nish and a number of others that I'd met who drank vodka straight up acting like it's water. And then as soon as he's done with his talk, he goes and eats pizza. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, mm, this isn't, you know, but he was clairvoyant. You see mm -hmm. many of these Tibetans were clairvoyant. So the, you know, the second that I met this guy, we're like, boom, we're totally humming on the same thing. Mm -hmm. We could actually read each other's minds. And so I helped um, assess his school, uh, got him started a little bit, and then uh, chose uh, three people uh, to come to Detroit to do the training uh, for the next that next fall. And so the seed school, which was a uh, trunk pause um, kind of, he had a commune that well, I could, he was, wasn't quite a commune, but he had this school there, and all these people followed him, and he wanted to have Waldorf. So notice that whether it be Findhorn or whether it be any place, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, or Theosophy, you name it, they usually, if they had uh, a following, they oftentimes um, uh, have to start a school. But if they don't have a philosophy for the school, if they don't have a curriculum for the school, then they turn to Waldorf. And so Werner was so well known in LA uh, in Hollywood and throughout actually the whole world, he knew everybody in anthroposophy that uh, he would just say, you know, Douglas, go do this for me. And, you know, they pay me to fly out there and do this because why I was bringing him students to. Uh, and uh, so that was when I started to get involved in Buddhism. But, you know, at the Mayflower bookshop, the Buddhist section had about as many books as the rest of the store. You know, it was yeah. like so many books books and Buddhism, I kept saying to myself, I am not going to try to understand Buddhism. It's not Christian. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. And then what happens? One of the great teachers, the teacher of the Dalai Lama, Gela Krimpache, moved to Ann Arbor. And I was swept up into that for a long time. He was my root guru. And then I had to start studying uh, all this uh, Tibetan Buddhism, which is incredibly deep mental training. And, but I'd say to all of them, because the top Rinpoches and Lamas and Geshes, they would all, uh, they were all clairvoyant. And they would, you know, you've heard this story, I've mentioned it before, they'd all call me the same name. And they, oh, so nice to see you again, Wang Pao Sanggo. And I never understood what the heck they were saying. It took me, I don't know, 20 years before I actually said, what the hell are you saying to me? And what are you what are you saying? Who who is this person? He goes, Oh, great tantric teacher of this. Okay, great. But I'd ask him all the same question. I'm clairvoyant. You're clairvoyant. I can see Christ in the etheric. Can you see Christ in the etheric? Because if you can't, I don't think you're clairvoyant. And they'd say, No, 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 no. Christ, no, 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 no. Avalokiteshvara, and then they give me this whole story of a human who sprouted 12 heads or 13 heads looking in all direction with a thousand arms to, you know, give, uh, to see the suffering of all humanity and then give the cure for it, give the spiritual tool that could help people get cured from whatever was their ailment, ailment spiritual or otherwise. And so they all would point at uh, uh, Vishvu Karma, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, Vishvakarma is, is the the uh, Vishnu manifestation that that is uh, pertaining to Avalokiteshvara and uh, Chenrezig in the Tibetan tradition. So that you have that uh, Buddha of compassion is what they would call it. But it's uh, you have to keep in mind that Rudolf Steiner was adamant that one has to understand that that 
Buddha, he, uh, the Buddha experience happened sixth century before Christ. But he said, Buddha didn't stop. He kept developing. And he is a, a big part of the mysteries of, of esoteric Christianity. Absolutely. And, you know, these people, to even become a high lama, you have to have clairvoyance and you have to have this memory capacity. And so that what Rudolf Steiner would call the etheric heart, this thing that comes back in, in the back of your head, I'd see this and I could look into it and I could, you know, literally hear them speaking and, and, his, and there's, they're chanting these things that they've memorized fantastic amounts of things all, all by memory. I would look at this and go, wow, I want to do that. I want that. I want to develop that. I want to have that capacity. But, you know, that's something that takes um, really a lifetime of training. So I never learned that, uh, but I could see it. And then they would basically then go, oh, okay, if that's if that's what you're saying, oh, if that's what Christ is, oh, yeah, 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 we believe in Christ. Because <laughs> they're, you know, they were so compassionate. I mean, I've never met a Tibetan Buddhist that wasn't filled with compassion. And of course, you know, we, we know the Dalai Lama, who is a very close friend of Gaelic Krimpache's. Gaelic Krimpache is literally the voice incarnation of the Panchen Lama, who is the senior teacher of the Dalai Lama in by tradition. And so... Gaelic Rinpoche also had that. And when he first came to America, he could barely speak English, but I would, he'd, he'd say these things and I would understand what he was saying, though I didn't know what he was saying. I, I didn't know any Tibetan. I never once had any inclination to learn Tibetan. Uh, but through these people, I actually started to meet some of the best clairvoyants I ever met in my life. Uh, but they don't consider it a big deal. To them, it's just like, oh, it's like having lunch. It's no big deal. You didn't understand what he was saying, but you knew what he meant. Precisely. And I'd see pictures. And 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 when they're doing this, and he's doing all these forums and this and that, and these, oh, right now, I'm not going to run around. I'd go, uh, what? Uh, oh. And then I'd say, does that mean so and so? And he goes, yes, that means that. And they'd go, Wow, you guys are amazing. So, uh, and women, there are, of course, I've met a few, like I met the Tolku of Fajr Gini, uh, Jetson Kushala. She was fantastically clairvoyant, fantastically compassionate. And in all cases, they just laughed all the time. It was like everything was funny to them. <laughs> everything, whatever it was, they could be teaching about pain and suffering and this, and then they just burst out laughing and, and say, you know, but that's okay. And some of them were crazy wisdom teachers, like my like my guru Gaelic Rinpoche, and I've had many. I've studied with many Tibetans, but he was uh, he was just so full of love. But he would also also do really really weird things. You know, he'd do them to you. When he first met me, he was obsessed because I had a little goatee. He'd grab my goatee and pull me close, and put his nose on my nose and kiss me over and over again. Or later, when I was wearing a taiguk one day, this this uh, uh, knife that you cut the body up with after you die and feed it to the vultures in the Tibetan tradition, I had one on. He goes, oh, taiguk, and he leaps up on me like what's called yab yum, or when you're in union. And he would do this, and it was so embarrassing that he'd do this in front of people. You saw him do it to me. He'd do it to you. He would, but that's crazy wisdom. Crazy wisdom, yeah. 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 And so uh, I found that the most clairvoyant people I I met thought nothing of it. It was just like breathing air. It was no big deal. But they were able to say, "Yes, Douglas, this is this is one of your problems. This is what you need to do." You know, if you you know if you left that behind, you know, or they'd say, uh, "Yes, well, how do you do that? Doesn't that cost a lot of money?" Ha ha ha! You know, like you should stop that. You know, it costs too much money. Or, you know, I, I've traveled around to meet all the great spiritual teachers because, yeah, you don't need that. <laughs> you don't need any of that. So it was always amazing when you'd meet really spiritual people. It was always the same, full of compassion, full of light coming out of their body. And they were oftentimes laughing the laugh of a child. And so that's what I wanted to say today in, in that without understanding some of the background of theosophy and some Tibetan Buddhism and Manly P. Hall's Philosophical Research Society and Edgar Casey's Association for Research and Enlightenment and 
and Anne Wigmore's uh, Hippocrates Health Institute and Mary Baker Eddy's uh, First Church of Christ scientist. That was in my background before I ever got to Detroit. So when I got to Detroit, it was like the center of a lot of these spiritual paths. Many, many of these people had come through Detroit. And if they came through Detroit, it was pretty likely that, you know, at least half of them had gone to the Mayflower Bookshop and met you and Robert Thibodeau. And so uh, that's what we'll take up uh, next time, what it was that the um, Waldorf Institute and the Mayflower Bookshop did to basically continue my spiritual search to try to figure out how I could most optimize these gifts, or as I like to call them, curses that were given to me at birth, so that I could help other people because I was only interested in helping other people. I wasn't, I wanted someone to commiserate with, but once I met the Tibetans and once I met some of these really amazing people who were clairvoyant, I didn't feel like a freak anymore. And I think that was really my, my real, my real issue was I just wanted to know that this was okay and that I wasn't some kind of uh, demonically possessed, weird uh, mutant clairvoyant or something. Really, I was just trying to prove I wasn't some mutation of humanity, but it was just maybe something carried over from a previous life or something like that. And once I got used to that, then it never surprised me when Werner said, Doug, get on the phone. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. And uh, we're at our, our time limit here for this particular episode, episode 17 and uh, finding that star and, here with the the really I call him eminent. He, he's he's one of my greatest teachers and one of my greatest pupils. And so that's a, a very important role in my life. And I I trust that many people are going to find a great deal of value in listening to these talks. And so I want to thank you. And you can look below, and there'll be links that can lead you to the books by Douglas and Tyla, and uh, they're operation the gospel of sophia and american intelligence media and all the wonderful work they've been doing with michael mckibben thank you all and hope you had a blessed easter for he is risen <laughs>